Okay, our, our final paper in the session is Aerophones in Flatland, Interactive Wave Simulation of Wind Instruments. Um, it's by Drew Allen and Nikunje Raghavanshi, and Drew will be giving the talk in a sec. Thank you, Robert. Hi, I'm Drew. Uh, I'm a musician by trade, and uh, I was uh, invited by Microsoft Research to come in as an intern and as a visiting artist uh, to develop some uh, synthesis programs. Uh, as a musician, I should say that I'm uh, largely interested in real-time synthesis methods, those of which that are informed by physics. Uh, and so what we produced, to, what I'm showing you today, is the first technique for real-time 2D wave simulation of wind instruments. Uh, let's start off with a simple demo. So here you have, uh, this is our simulation domain. Uh, the top area is where you draw and design your instruments, and the bottom is a little bit of information. On the left is the, it's the mouthpiece of your instrument, and there was a little spectrogram there. So let's take a look at this. Oh, my, my apologies. The user also specifies where breath enters the instrument. The mouthpiece is visualized on the bottom left. It has a single reed and attaches to the tube as shown. The mouthpiece reacts to the sound field inside the tube. It reads the field in the tube from a user-specified point. <laughs> Demonstrating the real-time effect. Let's talk just briefly about wind instruments here before we get into the details of the technique. Uh, typically, uh, for most kinds of traditional wind instruments, you can characterize the instrument into three parts, the mouthpiece, the bore and tone holes part, and the bell uh, at the end where sound radiates from. Uh, the mouthpiece uh, uh, is characterized largely as a nonlinear system, and it's a coupling between pressure inside the mouth and pressure inside the bore. Uh, the bore itself, uh, including the tone holes and bell, is largely a resonant cavity that is, that is largely linear. Uh, and there's a two-way feedback coupling uh, between this nonlinear system and the linear system, uh, which is really, really crucial to producing the particular musical tone. Yeah. In addition to looking at um, the clarinet excitation model, there's a couple of traditional excitation models that we cover in this system, and I can briefly discuss them right here, uh, details of which are in the paper. Uh, the first is the clarinet read. Uh, which couples the pressure in the mouth and the pressure in the bore using a dynamic reed. And this is a pressure-controlled valve where as you increase pressure in the mouth relative to the, that in the bore, the, the valve closes shut. Uh, consequently, the flip side to that is the lips, which is used in modeling brass instruments. And this is a pressure-controlled valve where uh, as relative pressure of the mouth increases, the valve uh, opens. And lastly, we're looking at also the air jet, which is a flow-controlled valve uh, where a oscillatory airstream uh, uh, moves along this knife edge labium point, which is the oscillatory. But in all three, you see there's, there's a dynamic element that is coupling the, uh, the respective pressures on either side. Um, in terms of related work, the current state of the art is the digital waveguide for real-time synthesis of wind instruments. Uh, typically, these are one-dimensional systems, signal processing systems. Uh, they were introduced by Julius Smith, uh, actually in the 1980s originally. Um, and they work a little bit like this. Essentially, what you have is you model the sound field of the instrument as uh, you decouple it into left and right traveling waves down the, down the length of the bell. Uh, and you model this usually with a pair of delay lines. At the end of the, bell, at the, end of the instrument, at the bell end, uh, you model the reflection and radiation using DSP filters. Uh, and where breath enters into the instrument, you uh, couple that uh, value of breath along with whatever inbound pressure values that are coming back from the reflection point uh, to generate flow back into the instrument. And uh, this loop, as, as uh, pressure cycles through this loop, uh, 
uh, though some gets lost from, a lot of it gets lost at the radiation filter, uh, because of that reflection filter, this is what builds up the resonance of the instrument and what produces the musical tone. Uh, if you want to introduce tone holes, you create uh, scattering junctions, which are uh, additional filters along the delay line edges, which produce radiation and reflection uh, at those tone hole positions. Uh, this is all using typical DSP filters, uh, so you have to know exactly how to tune those coefficients correctly in order to produce the physical characteristics you're looking for. Uh, our approach is to uh, capture all of the radiation and reflection of the bell and bore uh, directly using a direct 2D wave simulation on the instrument geometry. Uh, so this simplifies the process of constructing the, the instrument characteristics you're going for. Um, we then borrow those previous excitation models and adapt them for use in, in 2D. There's a few things you have to do to get them to work. Um, and the result is the, the real-time simulation that we have here. So going back to the simple clarinet instrument that I showed earlier, let's add some tone holes to that one. We can also, uh, to prove the point of that geometry matters a lot. Uh, if we have a slightly different stylized instrument, oops, uh, if we have a slightly style, different stylized instrument, um, the geometry of this instrument produces a different sound timbre, a different sound quality uh, to the instrument, and uh, the placement of the tone holes is very crucial to the tuning of the instrument. So let's hear a little bit of this one. So what are the advantages and challenges of this approach? Well, the advantages here, as I've demonstrated earlier, is that signal processing techniques, um, they effectively can demonstrate a lot of the properties in one dimension of these wind instruments, but it does require a significant amount of expertise and uh, measurement to be able to design and ensure this physical plausibility of the instrument that you're, you're trying to uh, model. Uh, what's nice about our technique is that this geometric manipulation is quite intuitive and it also guarantees this physical plausibility of the instrument. Um, it also lowers the expertise bar, so uh, musical exper experimentation can be done by, by non-professionals. It in, you know, invites people to a sandbox, sandbox environment. <sighs> the large uh, challenges of the system, however, are that because it's driven non-linearly and has these perceptually salient transients, that's uh, the sound quality uh, at the start and end of the notes especially, uh, it means that this can only really be done in a direct time domain simulation. There's not a lot of pre-cooking that can be done. Um, so then the rules of finite difference sort of play out um, there, so with stability and things like that. Uh, standard finite difference um, across, across this, uh, across this uh, domain, if, as you change boundary conditions with tone holes and things, will generate artifacts uh, as you change this geometry, and we'll discuss ways to resolve that. Um, further, in order to really capture the detail of an instrument, especially the curvature of the bell and the shape of tone holes and things like that, you really, really need a very, very fine millimeter scale resolution which then in turn requires, for num numerical stability reasons, requires very, very small time steps. So for our tests, we found that 3.8 millimeters was a very, very nice resolution, uh, which requires 128,000 uh, FPS on the GPU. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit on how to, how to make that happen. Uh, let's get into the uh, basic mathematical structure of the system. We start with the linear wave equation here described as a first order set of equations for pressure and velocity. And we introduce uh, a perfectly matched layer which will absorb uh, outgoing radiation on the, on the boundary domain, uh, here indicated with the sigma term. And this essentially gives us, uh, combined with, some, with uh, some settings for uh, zero boundary conditions, this gives us uh, decent static geometry, but it's not enough to get the thing that we really care about, that is dynamic geometry. Uh, in wind instruments, uh, there's a lot of manipulation of the shape of the instrument as you're playing. You have opening and closing of tone holes, you have, op you have uh, pistons and rotors that open and, and shut for brass instruments, you have slides, 
you know, introducing and taking away mutes and all of these kinds of things that uh, are incorporated into the musical expression. So they're important to account for. If you don't account for them, you hear these uh, uh, artificial uh, clicks that are produced by the simulation. Uh, which, are, which are sound unnatural. Uh, the way we solve for this is with a time-varying PML formulation. Uh, this is a modification of the previous form PML equation. And what we do is we introduce a beta term that slides between 0 and 1, which allows us to smoothly vary between uh, boundary state and air state. Uh, we also have a VB term here that enforces particular boundary conditions and input flow from the mouthpiece. And, uh, and it's all formed into a single set of equations. And this is nice because this allows us to handle all of the phenomena in the model from a single update equation without having to switch into conditionals, which helps in the real-time sense a lot. If we focus our attention on the second part of this equation for a moment and just take a look at the velocity update, you can see how when beta is zero, uh, this reduces essentially to a velocity setter. This happens at the boundary conditions and excitation positions. And when beta is one, we get the standard uh, error equation update. So what this means is this allows us then to very, very nicely over time interpolate those beta values to produce a variety of, of interpolation methods. Uh, which will result in much smoother uh, interpolations between geometry. So, uh, like I said, uh, the transition rate of B controls the smoothness quality of the transition, uh, and uh, you can vary that in order to get a, a, uh, a softer or harder response. So here it is without the dynamic geometry and then with the dynamic geometry. And again, this results in a simple conditional free update equation for the entire domain. Another thing that we have to account for here is for wall losses along the bore. Now this is something that in digital waveguides that are in one dimension, they don't really have to worry about because they're not accounting for transverse oscillations. Uh, in our simulation, we're looking at uh, the longitudinal along the bore as well as transverse modes in the bore. And this causes uh, some uh, sort of whistling artifacts to be produced by excitations. So we really need to model these wall losses. Uh, they're very, very essential in 2D. Uh, and the details of which are in the paper. But I'll give you a, uh, it's very clear that these are necessary. So I'll show you with and without here. Pretty straightforward there. <laughs> uh, we also introduce a high amplitude nonlinearity. It's a quite simple formulation, and it simply uh, increases the speed of sound in respect to high amplitudes. This is very, very important in brass instruments, as there's very, very high amplitudes, usually above 10 kilopascal, uh, that can propagate inside the bell, or inside the bore of the instrument. So this is essentially what makes brass instruments sound brighter. So this is, again, uh, without and then with. In terms of the GPU implementation, we begin by solving finite difference uh, using the 5.2D stencil. Uh, and this updates each cell uh, inside the domain using neighboring pressures and velocities uh, for each time step. We then uh, describe a cell as the pressure at that location as well as the velocity above it and the velocity to the right of it. We store all of this information inside a four-channel pixel. And the fourth channel, the alpha channel, stores state information relative to the cell. And this stores information like the beta value, uh, the, the sigma value, if this is a PML area, and whether or not it's an excitation or a listener. Um, we store each of these pixels uh, per fragment, and we store each of them inside a, a single texture that, sim that uh, represents our simulation grid. We then make four copies of this grid inside a single, very large texture, uh, which we bind as a single frame buffer. 
And then we ping pong within that frame buffer uh, so that all the reads and writes are on a single frame buffer, which cuts down the amounts of bindings uh, uh, and optimizes memory, me uh, memory bandwidth in the simulation. And then we ping pong through. Yeah. We then write output uh, pressure, which is the sound, uh, at each tick. Uh, to a reserve space on that FBO and pull at a block interval back to the CPU to push to the audio drivers. Okay, and now for some results. <laughs> so we'll start with our clarinet, and I use these words uh, very generally speaking, but obviously these are 2D instruments, so this is more of a clarinet. If you took a clarinet and flattened it down so that it was, you know, the, the width of which was, you know, a few, few millimeters, but it essentially has uh, very much the, though it is not uh, quantitatively the same as a clarinet, it has a certain qualitative resemblance to the instrument. So here we have a Chalamot melody, which is the low register of the clarinet, uh, playing a little, uh, little folk tune. We can also uh, use uh, the altissimo melody, uh, the altissimo range of the instrument, which uses the register key, which brings the, up the instrument into, into the higher octave. And I should mention that the difference in those two examples is simply which tone holes are opened or closed. I'm not manipulating the excitation. So again, the, the geometry of the instrument plays a huge role in how these work. Uh, also, if I take the exact same excitation mechanism and place it now on instead of a cylindrical geometry, I have something that is non-cylindrical or con somewhat conical, uh, we produce a sort of saxophone uh, or horn-like quality to the instrument. And uh, just like with real saxophones, if you start playing fast interlocking passages, it can start making squeaks and honks. Uh, we also, um, I hadn't talked a little bit of, as much uh, on the flute, but yeah, we, because we're modeling the air jet as well, we have these air jet models as well. And I should mention that all of the performances up to this point are not, are really essentially just uh, robot performances. You know, you push the button to start the note, push the button to stop the note. Very, very crude kinds of performances. And you'll see here, I mean, it's, there's a sort of a lack of sensitivity in a lot of the playing because of that. I mean, we'll get to this in, in a second. So that was a robot performer that was able to play the flute. But if we map a wind controller to the instrument, uh, we can have a little bit more fluctuation. We can have a larger dynamic range and, uh, and a more varied uh, expression. So mapping the excitation controls is very, very important. Moving on to brass instruments, we have, first we have a bugle and then followed by a trumpet. And what I'm demonstrating here is two different techniques to get different pitches on the instruments. Uh, with the lips, you can overblow the lips by applying more mouth pressure uh, or by increasing the tension of the lips in order to play higher harmonics of the instrument. Or you can use valves to change the length of the pipe. Um, and you can use a combination of the two in most. I'm a tuba player, so this is, this is my area. So first with the overblowing lips example on a bugle. And then with a valve system. <laughs> <laughs> 
moving on to trumpet with and without the bell and with a couple of different mutes. Kind of a silly example, but. And then we can look at a couple of different types of mutes. The straight mute. The cup mute. The harmon mute. We also have a couple of different examples demonstrating uh, more interesting dynamic geometry. So here we have a slide whistle where the actual borer is, di is entirely dynamic geometry, and we have this very silly interlocking valve system uh, uh, example as well. And if you hadn't already guessed, we can create some pretty ridiculous instruments, including things that are implausible to construct, let's just say. Um, yeah, so here's a tuba. So a rather inefficient instrument, but interesting to try out as well. And lastly, we have a, uh, an example here that just shows a couple different things all sort of together in a sort of real-time take. largely the way I imagine most people will be tweaking with this thing. Um, just to compare it a little bit to uh, STK, which is the synthesis toolkit, which is a yeah, standard, standard uh, uh, exercise here, just to compare it to uh, things that have existed before. Here's just some clarinet notes. And the higher key. Okay, so again, in conclusion, this is the first system for real-time 2D simulation of aerophones. Uh, in terms of future work, there's certainly a lot of things to look at. One main, main area is improving the control of excitation mechanisms, uh, looking at automatic tuning of this geometry, um, generalizing excitation models so that you could have sort of hybrids of clarinet reed type things with lips, um, and looking at more uh, specific modeling examples like the larynx or syrinx. Okay. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to my, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you again to my collaborators at Microsoft Research and to Kyle Rowan and Paul Hembry for providing the video examples you saw. Thanks. We maybe have time for one quick question before the break. Yeah, thank you. V very nice work. Thanks. So m my name is Laura Savio, and I come from the Aalto University. I would like to ask you about the... Uh, re recording of the sound. Did, did you record it in front of the bell, or how do you take into account the, what comes out from the sound holes? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. The crosshair that was indicated on the simulation, that's where you're sort of, that's the point at which you're measuring pressure from. And you can actually move this point around so that you can listen from the front of the bell or the, at, the, at the end of the other side. Yeah, like thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's thank Drew one more time, and that will conclude the session.